Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of Neat History, presented by Southern Bottle. I'm Jake. Some of you may know me from uh, Sobo Radio. I'm also one of the co-founders of Southern Bottle. Um, today I'm going to be doing my first episode of my new podcast, Neat History, as I just mentioned. Um, what we're going to be doing is going over some of the kind of different spirits and where they come from, as well as some different cocktails. Uh, today we're going to be starting off with gin, a little bit of history on gin, and then mostly focused on the gin grays. It seems like with everything going on right now with COVID-19, um, the gin grays is, is not a bad topic. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, get ready to be appalled with what was going on in London from around 1700 to 1760. So around that time, uh, gin became cheap as oil is now, uh, and literally anyone could make it. So to put it into perspective, uh, they say that around the time of, I believe it's 1730, um, there were 7,000 gin shops in London. So if you look at Starbucks in the UK in November of 2019, there was only a thousand Starbucks in the UK in its entirety. We're talking 7,000 gin shops in London alone in 1730. Uh, So why did this happen? Why were people just hammered all the time? Well, it's because slightly before that, um, around 1689, William of Orange took whatever the London people do, uh, parliament. He became ruler. He was. He got the throne. He was the throne. He won Game of Thrones, and he was the ruler. Um, so in 1689, he takes over. Um, obviously, most people know that there was a weird history with France. They were doing a lot of wars. He all of a sudden decides that he's going to ban some trade with France. Now that's a problem because at that time, um, cognac and brandy, uh, maybe just brandy, were both huge, but may. Um, you know, imported from France. It's what a lot of people in London were drinking. It was pretty cheap. It was affordable. Um, all of a sudden, you can't get that anymore. So immediately following this, he passes an act that encourages distilling uh, of brandy and other spirits from corn. Now, unfortunately, what came out of that was a lot of gin. So to backpedal a little bit, uh, if you're not too familiar with gin's roots, um, gin is actually from Holland. It comes from the word uh, genever. Uh, which is the Holland word for juniper. Uh, So it's made from juniper berries. It was originally designed as a medicine, much like a lot of drugs and alcohol are. Um, And I don't think anyone saw what was coming when they first created it. Um, I actually think it was a cure for gout originally. I don't know if it was much of a cure as it was. You're pretty hammered, so you don't even notice what's going on. Um, But that's kind of where it got its roots. So it makes its way to London. And then obviously nowadays, London is kind of best known for gin. Um, London Dry, you got Tangray, you got Bombay. I'm actually currently drinking Malfi, which is a London Dry from Italy. Uh, So it's unlike Champagne, where it actually has to be from that region. Anyone can make London Dry. And actually in the States right now, we have a lot of craft gins. Uh, But back to the gin craze. So... The gin craze really started to hit into full effect in around 1700. Um, At this point, people are making gin at just limits that are out of control um, to the point where pretty much anyone who could afford to have a vat and set up a still was making gin and just kind of penning on the street. Um, It was also only like the third career opportunity for women at the time. So if you didn't want to be a prostitute, or give birth to babies. Your other option was peddling gin out on the street, um, which helped push it a lot more. There's stories of people who actually had cats and dogs trained to deliver and sell gin on the streets. Um, Allegedly, people were just hammered, passing out everywhere, as if that entire 60-year period was one giant frat party. Uh, Even, it's to the point where a lot of people compare it to sort of the drug war we had in the States in the 80s. Um, Jessica Warner has actually called it the first modern drug, saying that it was worse for London at that time than things like heroin and crack were for us, Uh, which is just an outstanding thing to think about. Um, So to kind of put in perspective, Thomas Felding, uh, he's a a historian. Uh, He was around at, at that time. He has a quote that says, a new kind of drunkenness, 
unknown to our ancestors is lately sprung among us and which is not a stop to. Uh, it will infallibly destroy a great part of the inferior people. The drunkness I here intend by this poison called gin. So people were worried. People were worried that gin was just taking over not only like the lower class, but even starting to get into the upper class where people were just, everyone was drunk. Um, one of the most amazing stories that I think to come from it is actually uh, Ben Franklin at this time traveled to London and said that when he was in London, his colleague that he was there visiting woke up in the morning and had a gin for breakfast, had a gin for lunch, and then continued to drink, drink gin throughout the rest of the day. So imagine you are in the colonial United States and you go back to the homeland and everyone is just pissed drunk all the time hanging out. People were drinking 2.2 gallons of gin a year. If you're Ben Franklin, you're like, what the hell is happening? And also, you're a little bit jealous that we're just throwing tea into harbors and back at home, people are getting hammered on gin all the time, like it's going out of style. Um, but one of the more important things to remember is at this time, being drunk wasn't really like a problem. People didn't think of it as a bad thing. You could be drunk in the street. You could be drunk in the office. You could be drunk wherever you wanted to be. No one really looked down at it. Uh, it wasn't until after this that it kind of became a not so much cultural norm to be drunk. Um, I'm not saying that being drunk is not a norm. We've all been drunk in public, but like, you know, in the middle of the day, day drinking every day for 60 years. Not good. But uh, following this, I mean, it got to the point where the government, they had no control, or the parliament, sorry, had no control over what was going on. Um, and it kind of came to a head in 1734. There was a woman named uh, Judith DeFore. And she actually prepared to get dark. She strangled her two-year-old son and then sold his clothes so that she could afford to buy more gin. I don't know about you guys, but I have never needed a drink that bad in my life. And I'm on lockdown right now. It's hard to get a drink anywhere. So at that point, Parliament was just like, whoa, we need to pump the brakes. Um, and decided to put a stop to things. Uh, they started patch, passing a number of acts. It actually took eight acts to get this thing to slow down. That's how quickly this gin train was moving, and no one wanted to get left behind on it. Even after acts were coming out, people were still buying gin at an alarming rate. Um, so finally, one of the acts kind of started to hit in 1751. Um, it was a gin act which prohibited distillers from selling un to unlicensed merchants, so the kind of street peddling stopped. Um, and then some fees to small time merchants. So really it just became back to, you know, going to the pub and grabbing gin. Um, at that time, really anyone could do gin, but only pubs could do beer. So after this law passed, pubs were really the only ones doing gin and beer, um, which really started to put that stop to this in motion. Um, following that, there was also a super famous uh, print, sort of like a newspaper that came out. Um, by Hogarth, uh, that's in 1751, it's Gin Lane. And it's actually the image that is behind me right now. And it just depicted like the ridiculousness of the situation. Uh, people in the street, people leaving their kids, people fighting dogs for dead meat on the road, uh, people just pennying, like if someone died, they would just steal stuff off them in the street and then immediately go trade it and use the funds to buy gin. So after that, things started to take a slowdown. And by 1760, people were pretty much good and sober. Um, and that kind of wraps up the gin craze. But what's weird is if you look at gin nowadays, it's kind of more of that hipster drink um, where there's a lot of craft and botanical gins going on. Um, but formidably, so it, it has kind of a weird history of like at first it was a medicine and then it became this weird thing where it was... A hard drug essentially um and then in modern america well mid-century america it became like the classy drink with the french 75 and a gin and tonic and you know a gin martini obviously james bond things like that really brought gin into light um as like the upper class boring drink and not until lately has it resurged as more of the hipster alternative choice to vodka um that's most known for like its floral hints and things like that but 
thank you all for tuning in to my super quick episode on the gin craze. Uh, I hope that you guys join me next time. We're going to be doing a segment on tiki drinks. So that should be super interesting. And then later on the season, we're also going to have a brief history of Irish whiskey um, to give you guys a little teaser on that. At one point there were, I believe one or two distilleries in Ireland because everyone had to collapse to one. Uh, it's a super crazy story. We'll get into details in a couple of weeks, but thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please subscribe. If not, also, please subscribe. Take care, guys.